Hey everyone, welcome to the live 18 Strong podcast today. Today we have our buddy Nick Catterall here on the show, fitness extraordinaire, working with the PGA Tour players. And um, he is going to kind of give us a status on, you know, what's going on with a lot of these tour players, what's going on with their workouts, how he's working with his guys remotely, and now that everybody's kind of at home. So I uh, want to bring him in in just a second. And first of all, I want to say thanks to our sponsors here on the podcast, which is Link Soul, Make Par, Not War, our favorite apparel brand in the golf space, both for on the course and off the course. To get your 18 Strong discount, your 20% off on anything Link Soul, go to 18strong.com slash Link Soul. You'll get the most updated code for your discount. As you can see, I've got my Link Soul cap on, and I'm pretty much decked out in Link Soul every single day these days, both in the house and outside on the golf course, whatever it might be. All right, let's bring in our buddy Nick. Nick, what's hey. happening, man? Welcome to the show. <laughs> Welcome back to the show, I should say. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. Um, obviously, it's an exciting um, experience with innovation happening with, uh, you know, Facebook Live or, you know, the live content that's going out these days because everyone's having to obviously push around and figure out new ways of dealing with things. So thanks for having me back on. Thanks. It's, yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah, you bet, man. It's it's awesome. It's almost like just kind of uh, sitting at the coffee shop, having our having our cup of joe and, you know, chatting with friends over, <laughs> over the line, hopefully with several people watching in tune. <laughs> Um, so Absolutely, tell me, yeah. Tell me, how, how have you been kind of um, really passing the time? Because I know, obviously, you're on the road most of the weeks of the year working with the PJ Tour, and with that being shut down, I know you're working with your guys, but you personally, how are you spending most of your days, and what's kind of become your routine? Um, yeah, following the um, – because, I mean, we, we got the word um, the Thursday night of the players um, in Jacksonville, so – it's been kind of a whirlwind since then um, as to what I've had to prepare for my guys, what I've had to prepare for myself personally, and uh, just the ways that we've had to sort of snap to uh, making decisions on what happens for the, the next period of time um, that we've got off. So uh, me personally, my day looks like uh, get up in the morning, have a couple of coffees, and then <laughs> Jump on the computer, um, make sure that my programs are um, intact and, and are updated uh, for the guys that I have um, on the road. Basically, I the way I program is throughout the whole year, I have an online-based system um, that we constantly refer back to and, and we use for trainings to make sure that um, everything is, is in context and compliant throughout the weeks. Um, but So basically, I jump on and do that. Um, I had to go and make my single car garage a gym, like most people did. They all, um, there was a massive dash for kettlebells, barbells, yeah. uh, plate weights, all the rest of it. So um, I was lucky enough to sort of get on the um, the early end of that, where it wasn't all bought out at this point in time. Um, we've got a, a company in Austin that I, I didn't realize was in Austin um, that that sells equipment and um i went in there probably about a month ago just to see what was in there and then um i had a quote um from a guy that was there and the quote was still valid so uh as soon as the uh the covid stuff came up and the tour got canceled um i went and paid that uh that nice. invoice <laughs> and uh and then got a whole bunch of stuff in the in the garage so now i've got a um a garage gym with a weightlifting platform uh squat cage um barbell plate weights kettlebells that kind of thing so it's it's now it's kind of uh got everything i need that um that i can train so um dylan one of my guys dylan who we talked about on the podcast last sure. time um he lives in austin and um we've been sort of hammering it out probably about four or five times a week in there so it's been good to have that ability to still train yet um whilst you know everything is still social distancing and quarantining we've still been able to get really good work done yeah, very cool. T take me back to um, when you were at the Players' Championship because they, refresh me if I'm wrong, they played the first day, right? And then did they cancel yeah. it the second day? How, how did that, that whole thing play out for you guys? Uh, that was an interesting time because um, that week, at the start of the week, we'd learned that the NFL was putting things on hold um, and a lot of the other sporting, the major sporting codes were starting to shut down. Um, like the, 
I think the a couple of guys in the Utah Jazz got tested positive, and um, and that's when everything sort of from the the basketball side of things started to really close down and and postpone their season and so forth. So um, golf was really the last sort of major sport on the calendar to be able to well still function um, as a, a a tournament event, yet they still had to make the decision whether or not they were going to continue. So the players uh, championship was, there was a lot of buzz about, you know, whether or not we're going to continue playing. And, um, and then it seemed all fine and and well, it didn't seem like anything was going to get canceled up front. So we were preparing like we would Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday came around. uh, um, Spectators were allowed on the course um, on the Thursday, Thursday round one happened. Round one was concluded um, and then it would. It seemed like uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday was going to be no spectators from then on. So that was the word that was getting around at that point in time, where they were just going to be able to play because it's an it's out in the open environment. And, you know, it was going to be quite easy to to social distance at that point in time, just with no spectators on the course. So we did think that play was going to continue Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but. Um, we got a text late about 10 and 30 at night on, uh, on the Thursday night. Um, I was staying with one of my guys, um, and he came up and knocked on the door at 10 30 PM and said, uh, yeah, the, the tournament just canceled the event and, um, has postponed all future tournaments up until I think it was the PGA at that point in time. So, um, we were just a bit shocked and we weren't on we really, we just didn't know what to do. So. Um, we actually had a few beers on the, the Thursday night <laughs> uh, and took it easy and uh, and then sort of just started to lay out some ideas of what uh, the next sort of six to eight weeks was going to look like. So at that point, we were sort of just a little bit, you know, dazed and confused with uh, what was actually going to happen. What was the general consensus of a lot of the guys at the tournament, both, you know, fitness guys, caddies, players, did, did a lot of them want to continue to play at that time? Were some guys nervous about playing even on that Thursday? Um, you definitely have with, you know, 125, 130 people on the, um, on the roster of, of the players championship, you, you definitely have both sides of, uh, of the argument, whether or not they should or shouldn't be playing. Um, there was people like uh, CT Pan who left early just because he didn't want the risk of of getting sick, um, especially being in such a um, you know TPC at uh, Jacksonville is a huge big building, but um, everyone's in the same dining area, everyone's in the same areas. So you know he made the decision to get out of there and just say that you know enough's enough and I'm out. Um, and then you got people who were you know the players in in the the locker room on Thursday evening going, well, we want to play the rest of the week, you know. We want to play as much as we can. We want to play until uh, we basically got told that we couldn't play. So um, you had strong arguments from both people um, on either side of the the fence. But at the same time, um, you know, the Jay Monaghan and the PGA Tour, um, they all had to make very hard decisions. And it was probably... Uh, the good decision at the, that point in time to uh, cancel those events just based on, um, you know, not saving face, but just, you know, doing it for the right reasons as opposed to just pushing on when they, they really sort of didn't need to or have to, even though they would have, it would have cost them a whole bunch of money um, to, to cancel those events. It's, it was in the interest of um, public safety and in the, in the interest of uh, the players' safety and, entry, and, you know, if, if it, it would only take one person to get sick for, a whole bunch of people to sort of then catch it just based on the, you know, how tightly knit the, the tournament circus is that travels from week to week. So, um, just kind of like, uh, the F ones, uh, one of my buddies is a physio for the, the Haas team. And he said that all, it, all it's going to take is one person in the, um, the yard to get sick for the whole thing to shut down. And lo and behold, they had that event in Australia and one person got sick and then it was just canceled from there on in. So, um, thankfully the PGA tour took those initial steps, um, to, to sort of get in early. Whereas, you know, if they had left it for a couple of weeks and one or two people got sick and then it, you know, it, um, it didn't end up well for those people. It would have been a lot worse, obviously. It's one of those things where at the time 
you know, we didn't realize how serious everything was. And it was kind of like, really, I, don't you think that the PGA Tour could figure out a way to get these guys to, you know, separate? And, you know, that was us kind of selfishly wanting to see more golf and especially with everything else canceling. But obviously, looking back, it was definitely the right decision. And um, as much as we didn't like it as fans and patrons of the different sports, it definitely makes sense. How has this affected, well, yourself and even other guys, you know, kind of in your position that they travel a lot? And I'm even curious, some of the players that, you know, maybe aren't kind of the top tier players that are making millions of dollars yet. Some of these guys are guys that just got on tour and now they're not getting paid weekend, just like everybody else, you know, or not everybody, but a lot of people on the planet. How has this impacted some of your closest friends or even some of the players that you work with? Yeah, it's it's impacted everyone on varying levels. Um, and it's obviously going to impact people that you didn't think that it would impact as greatly as it did just based on their current situations. So, um for people that have, you know, just say rookies on tour, their first year on tour, and they, you know, haven't had the time and experience under their belt to sort of get some cash under their, you know, uh, in their banks, and um, they've still got people to pay, they've still got, you know, um, families to feed. So it's it's a hard situation for a lot of people based on, you know, granted they're probably better off, I would say, um, than than a lot of other people that are struggling out there. But um, at the same time, you know we've all got people in our, um, circle that, um, have varying, um, obligations. Um, they've got clinics, they've got, um, you know, gyms that aren't going to be open for the next couple of months. So, um, you know, there's lost revenue, they've got staff to employ or, you know, get rid of, unfortunately, um, due to the fact that they can't pay them, um, because there's no income. So there's, varying people out there that that it's been hit harder than most and then there's some that will sort of weather the storm better than others so um like a whole bunch of caddies i know they they don't have a regular retainer so caddies are probably in a in a particular situation where they're relying on certain incomes for the next two months that that they won't they won't get at this point in time um and Caddies are a different breed anyway in relation to how they get paid and what they get paid. But at the same time, um, it's high risk reward. Um, and so, you know, the high risk is obviously waiting out and holding out for those events that the, their guys do well. And unfortunately, if you take away uh, eight or nine of those events, there's very, um, you know, the risk goes through the roof and the reward becomes, you know, nil to nothing. So um, hopefully they've planned, uh, you know, well enough uh, in advance to, to try and have a little bit of something, you know, tucked away for these kind of situations. But uh, if there's no money coming in, it's it's very hard to, to support a lifestyle that, um, you know, obviously requires uh, a certain income. So has the tour been keeping you guys up to date or at least even your players as to, any new developments or any new timelines um, as far as what might be the first tournament that they're looking at having or what's going on with any of the majors? Uh, I can't comment too, too closely on that one. Um, my guys get told what they sort of get told when they need to. Um, and it, uh, it changes day to day based on what the government does. So um, I have no doubt that the, the PGA Tour is just kicking back and, and looking at what the regulations are being put in place by the government as to when they can start having uh, events that over, you know, a thousand people, that kind of thing again. Um, but I haven't really gotten much information from, um, from my guys and I don't know too much information that they've gotten from the PGA Tour. So. I'd say they'll be following um, and, and looking very closely at what the NBA does and, and what the um, NFL does and, and just sort of following that lead. Um, you know, they might take initial steps to, to sort of be the, the front runner to sort of get them back out on, on the course just because it is a, is a different environment. Um, you can sort of still restrict, uh, you know, spectators and whatnot if you do want to get back on the course. But at the same time, it's, it is that there is still risk of, um, you know, of, of of sick people becoming sicker. So, um, yeah, I'm not, not too sure on the information flow there. Do you, do you think we have any hope of there still being a masters? I know that there's been talk about, you know, maybe October, November, obviously it all depends on what's going on, but do you think that that, that that's even feasible or, you know, do you, what, what do you have uh, in mind there? So, I mean, I've, 
I've thought about what the PGA Tour would do, and then they've done the complete opposite of what I thought they would do. So, um, you know, for me to to it's all speculation, <laughs> but I would say that if there is a hope for the Masters now that the Olympics has been uh, postponed to next year, it would fit in right before the Wyndham tournament, um, which is you know uh, basically one week before playoffs. So. Having the Masters actually have an opportunity to, to to be played, I think that now that we have a week off before the end of the season, it would fit nicely in there based on the fact that it's probably one of the biggest events, if not the biggest event of the year. Mentioning the Olympics, kind of pre-COVID stuff, um, what was kind of the mentality of guys that were looking at possibly going to the Olympics? I know, you know, four years ago, it was a little bit of a different story and guys weren't, I forget what was going on at that time too, but there was something where guys didn't want to go. Uh, to... It was, it was the Zika. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. That seems like a, like nothing now. Right. But correct. What, yeah. Um, what were guys thinking about the Olympics this time around? Was it something that more guys were wanting to do and represent their country? Cause I know like Ricky Fowler and the guys that went last time, I think it was Kucher, you know, they hyped it up and talked about how great of an experience it was. Absolutely. Um, and if you talk to anyone else outside of golf um, that, that was in a um, track and field at, at school or um, was in any sport that has been played or is geared towards going to the Olympics in, um, in any other code, um, you know, I always dreamed about being a, um, a soccer star going to the Olympics, you know, <laughs> um, and it was it's something that, that a lot of people that, you know, <clears throat> golf wasn't necessarily thought about as an Olympic sport. So um, there was a lot of talk on tour about, oh, it should only be amateurs, you know, it shouldn't be professionals, you know, professionals get paid, blah, blah, blah. But um, for me, the Olympics is the best of the best caliber of athlete um, competing in their event it, in any sport or any code. So um, to hear the guys come back from the Rio Olympics um, – and just tell everyone uh, what a, an amazing experience it was being amongst some of the best athletes in the world, if not you know, the, the best athletes in the world at that point in time. And watching other athletes compete at, in, at that level was uh, was phenomenal. And there's always a story with, um, you know, where Ricky um, and his coach, um, Troy Van Beesen, go into – uh, the gym and you know there's power lifters in there there's gymnasts there's a whole bunch of um, track and field athletes doing their thing and you know they're rolling in there to, to train just like anyone else and you know just to have that environment and that uh, um, that excitement in the air was something that they you know constantly refer back to and and I think to compete for your country is is a whole nother you know class of kind of like the Ryder Cups, kind of like the, the President Cups, you know, you, you're involved in a team and rarely are you involved in a team in golf, let alone playing for your country. So I think that, you know, in my mind, it's probably still one of the best um, opportunities you'll ever get um, to to be in that position. But a lot of the guys didn't even sort of think about it that way. Um, I know a lot of the pros were just talking about, you know, that it shouldn't be played um, as as professionals. A lot of them said that, that, that just amateurs should be playing in the Olympics. And um, I know they obviously had their own reasons for that. But um, uh, the guys that came back, like Justin Rose, you know, said how what an amazing experience it was. And uh, I remember I got a photo with him uh, with his gold medal um, in uh, – what was it? It was – was, <laughs> where were we? Um it was up in Long Island, um, one of the playoff events. Um, what is it? Four years ago now, um, and I, that was an exciting time for me. I had never really seen a medal before, but um, to see a gold medal, you know, with him, just super stoked to, you know, have it around his neck is just amazing. So, I think um, anyone that's been sort of talking to those guys will will actively want to play. But you'll always have some of the big guys that just want to focus on the tournament season and, and want to focus on the finals. So. Um, it is what it is. I mean, the, the Olympic um, schedule wasn't going to be an easy one this year either because effectively you kind of have to be there for the first week um, where you have the opening ceremony. So I think it would have been where you're over in um, playing the British and then you, you literally then jump on a plane to go to Japan for two weeks. So um, it wasn't going to be an easy schedule either way. So um, 
you know, for those guys that were obviously had their sights set on it, it would have been an amazing experience, but it would have been an easy, um, easy one to just sort of pass off for a lot of guys. Sure. You mentioned playing for your country in Ryder Cups and President Cup. Have, have any of your players been involved in, in either of those? Yeah, so um, um, I had a guy in the Seoul uh, President's Cup, and they said it was uh, absolutely amazing. And um, one of my guys, Cam Smith, just played in the President's Cup in Australia um, and did extremely well. And and you know, especially with the, the Aussie mentality, is you know that you you know you play for your mates, but you also play for your your team and your country. But um, they seem to get into it a lot more than what some people would. Um, just based on the fact that <laughs> we love team sports in Australia as well. Um, so to have them come back and tell us, you know, just how much of a, a good experience it was. And I was lucky enough to get down there for three or so days of the president's cup. And, you know, the, the atmosphere was electric. Um, and I obviously know a lot of people in the USA team and to, to hear them, <laughs> um, Obviously, they were on the receiving end of a lot of uh, of comments, <laughs> uh, especially in public, but um, just on the on the uh, the course as well. Um, the crowd was actually really, you know, not favouring the uh, the Australian side. Uh, sorry, the international team, but they were favouring a lot of the Aussies that were playing. But uh, there was definitely a lot of USA supporters out there, and and quite vocal USA supporters as well. So I mean. Um, the guys that went said they had an amazing time, and Melbourne's obviously an, uh, an awesome place. So um, it'll be very interesting to see what the the next one's like in in the USA. Yeah, that was such an exciting one to watch. You know, I think a lot of times the Presidents Cup kind of takes a bit of a backseat to the Ryder Cup, and this one was so close, and you know, it was such a nail biter to watch that it was awesome. Plus, just the setting of it. It was at Royal Melbourne, right? And I mean, that place Correct. just just looked incredible. And many say that that's one of the top two courses ever made you know for for people to play not just professional golf but any kind of golf on have you ever played it yourself no no um if i like my I look around that that course i would be losing balls left right and center so um it's not something that that i endeavor to play i have enjoyed walking around it many times um but it's not something that i'm like oh, i've got to go and play this course like a lot of people would um it's just, you know, you can't get much of a better. Um, so, like the sand belt um, courses that they have down there are uh, very, very different to what you have in the rest of the world. The way it was um, designed, the the, the layout, the um, the way that they did the event too was was really good um, because you had lots of viewing um, positions. Um, but it's also quite a difficult course to get around and and take advantage of, of those viewing points just because of the, the design of the course. So um, it was good for spectators in a lot of areas and then it wasn't so good for spectators in a lot of areas. Uh, but to play the course, I'm sure, is is up there on people's uh, top hit list um, just due to the way that the, the course was designed, the, the sand belt, you know, um, courses and just like it is up like in Pebble Beach, you know, it's it's very scenic. Um, but yeah, it's on the it's on the hit list for sure. <laughs> What's when you're there at an event? Because obviously you're inside the ropes, you're working with the guys. How is it different from your perspective as far as just the the excitement amongst the players? You know, obviously it's a, it's the team event. It's different and kind of day to day. What's different the way that you guys interact and go about your business? Maybe practicing things like that. Are the guys more involved together when they're warming up and practicing, or they still kind of have their own routines and do their own thing? Um, I think with the, like the team events, like the president's cup, it's, it's very much a, um, you get that team environment where you practice together, you play together. Um, you know, I wasn't directly involved with the team this, this time around, um, which is, you know, it, you have your individual guys there that, um, look after you guys, but at the same time, like when you, when you have, um, you know, a team of, I don't know, let's just say 20 people um, that you've got to uh, look after in terms of playing on the course, uh, practicing, um, you know, doing short game. Everyone's got their own routines. However, everyone needs to have their own routines whilst being in the team environment. So they practice together, they play together whilst doing their own thing. They still do it together. <laughs> right. 
So I think Ernie Els did a really good time, um, did really well with the international team this time around. Um, um, you know, the logo, the branding, um, the the way that the team sort of uh, felt, I suppose, was quite different to, to previous years. So um, I think that was largely due to um, what he wanted to do with the team, which was fantastic. Uh, and I don't think we've seen a President's Cup team do, you know, so well, so close, you know, have it come down to the last day. Um, like they did Um, so it was a credit to them in what they did yeah the branding was cool you know they had the different logos and everything it really it looked pretty sharp which I think you know to many people might not be a big deal but I think that also gives the players a little bit more pride in in playing and you know being a part of that team you always want to wear a cool jersey and have a have a great logo (laughs) and you know represent Um, I'm curious just going back to you and working with your players at this time obviously you said that Dylan is able to actually come and you guys are able to to still get a lot done because you have access to the equipment at your place Uh, but some of the other guys in in every player is going to be different I think we talked about that on the last show that that we were uh, had you on that you know you've got different guys that have just different mentalities as far as it goes when it's their training methods and things like that what are some of the ways that you've been really keeping up and uh, you mentioned your platform that you use, but are you on Skype calls with these guys? Are you interacting pretty much on a daily basis? Yeah, sort of. Um, I talk to my guys most days, um, if not two or three times a day. Um, there's always questions surrounding, you know, what you should and shouldn't be doing, as in, like, am I doing this right? Or um, so there's videos back and forth. There's, um, you know, program updates, so I can see what they've logged um, from their homes. Uh, I can see how many sessions they've done for the week, and then I can um, calculate, you know, um, various volumes and intensities off that. Um, so. In terms of what I was able to do, after um, we sort of got that call in Jacksonville, I stayed in Jacksonville for a few days to try and help set things up with with Cam at his place. Um, And then I drove to Augusta to see some of my other guys and set things up there at home. So um, for a lot of people, this this time could be, you know, just a a time off, a break, you know. It's kind of like uh, what Phil Mickelson um, put out over over Twitter not too long ago. He's like, um, you know, I've got this time. I can use it in two different ways. I can, you know, get get strong, get powerful, get fast, um, or I can sit on the couch and and you know drink wine and and watch TV. Um, and he said that the latter was winning at that point in time. So um, very rarely do we get periods of this time in golf, and. For some people, it's going to be a time where they literally do nothing, um, spend it with family, just relax. Um, because, to be honest with you, like a, you don't get that amount of time um, at home when you're a professional golfer, unless you're, you know, sort of running your own schedule. Um, so for those guys, it's it's a period of uh, of time to to decompress, um, refocus, um, get hungry again um, if they've been playing a lot of golf. Um, and then for other guys, uh, like my guys, I, I've just been basically trying to push on to them that this is a gift, you know. Um, eight weeks is, is a lot of training time. Um, and it's if you ever wanted to get, you know, better at something, whether it be strength or speed or um, just having a more resilient body, this is the time to do it based on the fact that there is no competitive stress going on at this point in time. Um, you can be completely recovered every day if you, if you do the right things. Um, so managing the loads from week to week is, is very important. Um, and progressively getting better over this, this period of time can really sort of focus you well coming into whatever tournament we, we end up back at, which I think at this point is going to be the Fort Worth event if it doesn't get pushed further along. So I think um, the PGA has been postponed. The Byron Nelson has been postponed. And I think the the first event back will be the Fort Worth event, um, which is colonial. I think it's now – I don't know what it is now. I think it's Amex or something maybe. Um, But, yeah, so um, to have this period of time for a lot of guys is going to be amazing. So, um, you know, it's kind of like two – if, uh, if everyone has the same period of time off, um, those who use it wisely will do better towards the, the rest of the season, whereas those who don't use it wisely and 
um, possibly have a few more beers throughout the week or, you know, like sit and do nothing. Um, whilst they, they are allowed to do that, there are other guys out there that are doing all that they can to try and get to, to the finish line um, in the best shape that they can. So for me, I was always going to use this as an off-season, um, off-season, um, and, and repurpose, refocus, and um, put in some goals that, that are obtainable so that we can get you know, hit the ground running when we, we get back on tour. For most of these guys, this is like the only real off season they've had in a couple of years because most of the time they, you know, they're playing almost every single weekend or you know a couple weekends a month. Absolutely, um, and you know I had this really nice, neatly laid out um, annual plan at the start of the season, and it turned to shit basically. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's it's. It's one of those things that you got to refocus and uh, and figure out what you actually want to do and what you want to have out of this time. So, um, you know, if if having an off season where you have four weeks off, you don't touch the clubs or you don't touch the, you don't step in foot in the gym, is what you really need, um, and you think that you'll gain something out of it, and then you have four weeks worth of intense training coming back. So be it. That's that's probably you know the best thing for a few guys and and mentally, you know, golf is such a mental game, right? So. If you're finding that uh, you were a little bit burnt out coming out of the the players' event, um, you know, have three weeks off. Um, set your sights on on having a, a five week, um, you know, intensive program coming up to the start of the season again, the start of the middle season. Um, so, you know, I think um, those guys that played the Presidents Cup, those guys that went straight to the Tournament of Champions at, in Hawaii, they really only got a week off, and it wasn't even a really um, good week to sort of decompress and and get back into a time zone because they would have gone from Australia back to the USA back to Hawaii. So, you know, for a lot of guys, yeah, they they haven't had an off season. So this might be the perfect opportunity for those high um, performing guys to really just chill out for a bit and and relax. Are your guys still able to to get out and make some swings and play a little bit? It's probably different for everybody depending on what the location is. Yeah, I think if there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, a lot of public courses out there that aren't being uh, monitored at this point in time. So um, there's guys sort of shucking their own balls and and, um, and just doing whatever they can. Um, my recommendation would be to those guys, like to my guys especially, is to keep up with the swings as much as they can. Um, vary the load, you know, drop the drop the volume of, of swings, obviously, and the intensity of swings, but just keep going. Like it's... It is a perishable skill and, um, you know, you do have uh, points in time where you do need to, to just keep, even if it's at a low intensity, just keep playing, um, just keep hitting balls and um, obviously have a purpose with what you're doing for it. But at the same time, um, a lot of courses have been closed. So finding um, guys go to different, so I think Dylan was at the, like the one of the public courses here in Austin because a lot of the courses have been shut down. So he went out to one of the halls and just played a couple of holes and, you know, just did whatever he could to just keep it going. So um, for a lot of these guys too, they play golf every day of their life. So to then suddenly get locked in a house for eight weeks, not, you know, hitting, not um, doing any sort of walking like they used to is, is kind of a bit of a shock. So, and then you get, you know, and then you get like Twitter and Instagram um, updates with uh, Ricky and Justin, you know, social distancing in their their golf carts and stuff like that. So, um, it yeah, it comes from all angles. It'd be be kind of cool to be just a regular guy walking up to the the local Muni course, getting ready to tee up, and you're like, oh, that's that's Dylan Fratelli over there on the putting green. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs> Not too shabby. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and you know, like half of these courses are goat tracks, right? So. Um, It'd probably take them back to their humble beginnings of uh, of when, when they first started out, not playing on nicely manicured greens and you know, and fairways that you know you could uh, you know <laughs> eat a eat a steak off. Yeah, play, um, playing golf like the rest of us in the world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, I know last time we had you on the show, we talked a lot about just recovery and restoration, and and I know that you're a big fan of, or at least at the time you were using the Whoop Strap. Do you, do you have all your guys use that? Still got still got line running. Um, yeah, yeah. You still use that with all your guys? And I'm curious what you've seen over the past couple of weeks. Now that everybody's kind of you know slowed down a little bit, have you seen a change in numbers? 
<laughs> for sure. Um, not speaking about their numbers at all, but um, my own numbers, my recovery ratings are through the roof. My, my sleep team, yeah. is like eight or nine hours a night. <laughs> Obviously, if you've got kids and stuff like that, it's uh, you know it's probably just business as usual. But um, you know, stress is a, a huge thing. We don't really. Um, put enough stock into what um, performance anxiety and stress can do to our bodies and our neurological systems um, and just our our health in general. So to have, um, obviously, health is a stress at the moment with being sick, but at the same time, we don't have a lot of stress from performance. We don't have a lot of stress from, uh, like, in a physical nature, we're, we're bound up at home. So um, you might do a gym session, but then you're just sitting on the couch most of the day or, or riding a bike or something like that. But so recovery ratings are going through the roof. Um, everyone's in the green most of the time, unless they've done some really big sessions. Um, uh, sleep numbers are good. Everyone's sleep nutrition is amazing. Like they're getting to sleep at the right times and they're, they're waking up at the same time. So falling into this nice, neat little pattern is, uh, is sort of what's, what the trend is that I'm seeing from all my guys. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting to see what happens when we're kind of forced to slow our lives down and you know, the, the benefits that come with something crazy, like what's going on in the world. I'm curious just for you personally, what has been, uh, the, the worst and most challenging part of this whole thing, you know, being stuck at home and, and the distance with the, the players and whatever it might be. And then what also has been the best thing to come out of it for you personally? Um, the worst thing is probably the insecurity of, about the, the current environment. Um, job security. I know a lot of people out there have lost their jobs. Um, a lot of people out there who have, um, been given options to, to reduce in numbers or take holiday right now, that kind of things. Um, so job security is always a stress, um, especially in this environment. Um, so I'm, you know, in a fortunate position where I know my guys really well and I'm, you know, I'm still working with my guys, you know, if you know, with it from afar, but, um, job security is always going to be a stress around this kind of thing. Um, like I know a lot of strength and conditioning coaches and, and therapists back in Australia who have worked for clubs for a long time and they've lost their jobs um, just due to the fact that they're, to, to put it bluntly, we're in the entertainment industry. Um, and if we can't entertain anyone, there's no money coming in. So naturally, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of jobs that <clears throat> aren't on the table anymore. So um, that probably is, is the main stress. Um, just being at home for me is a big win. Um, I don't usually get a lot of time at home. Um, not doing anything too, like you, you're basically homebound, which is, is such a rarity. So I think this is going to be a really good thing for a lot of people. Um, it could be possibly a bad thing too. I don't know. I think that the divorce rates are probably going to go up a little bit and <laughs> And and the opportunity, I think we're going to have a whole bunch of kids born in January as well next year. So, um, you know, it kind of goes both ways. If you if you need that time at home, this is the time that you can really spend with your family, get to know them again, and uh, enjoy enjoy that time being together and and you know um, feeling that presence. But um, for a lot of people too, if if they didn't necessarily have things uh, at home that were um, uh, in a, a kosher setting and if you know what I mean, if things weren't good at home, then, you know, being at home full time is, is definitely going to make that go one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like things, whatever direction you were heading, it's just going to escalate because of the, <laughs> yeah. the closer proximity. I, I know you're a big reader. I know you like to educate yourself and, and what are you reading anything in particular, whether it be for education or just for fun. And then uh, of course I want to know what you're binging on, on Netflix or Amazon prime or whatever too. Oh yeah. Um, so last first I'll do Amazon. Um, I think we're doing hunters at the moment, which is the, um, Nazis in the USA, the, the Jews are hunting the Nazis in the USA, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so that was a, a pretty good, uh, show. Um, also going back to do Homeland. <laughs> I never, uh, saw I never that. really, yeah, no, I was the same. And then um, one of my guys is like, you should really do Homeland from the beginning. Because I didn't realize I had like six seasons. I was like, holy shit. So I'm going back to do that again. I'm through to the second season. Um, still keeping up with reading. I'm doing a lot of mentoring sessions at the moment because I've got available time. Um, so there's some uh, really educated people in the world um, in strength and conditioning and um, 
in in physical therapy as well that I'm sort of getting or have the time to chat to now and um, which is amazing because normally a lot of the education has to come from either you reading something or um, you going to a conference and whatnot but um, now that I actually have time to chat with these people properly and they're at home I'm at home there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to chat so uh, it's good so I'm really able to sort of get on top of my uh, mentoring sessions um, there's a couple of uh, really good um, journal articles out there that I've got um, to read over the next week. Um, some good golf literature that's just come out from from Australia as well, which is nice. Um, so I'm going to dive into that a little bit more. Um, and I actually just took an online Excel course. Um, so Excel, excelling at Excel is is one of my uh, goals amazing. for the next year. <laughs> Yeah, so on top of everything, you get a little bit more time at home, and uh, yeah, so we're just uh, just keeping up with everything. I, I knew a guy like you wouldn't be wasting all this time at home. I knew you'd be <laughs> soaking it up in that big brain of yours. All right, man, where's the best place that people can follow you and your your antics and everything, especially when you get back out on the road with your guys and on the tour? Uh, so Instagram's my uh, my probably my most used social media outlet. Um, um, uh, Nick Catterall or Catto Golf is my Instagram handle, C-A-T-T-O-G-O-L-F. Um, I basically just post a whole bunch of random stuff on that um, just for fun, shits and giggles. If it's not fun, it's not worth posting. Um, and then uh, my website is currently being improved, but I think it's up, which is uh, com. So, um, yeah, anything that I um, have or post or be diving into over the next sort of six to eight weeks will be basically bounced off those two uh, sites. <laughs> Sounds good. Any last piece of advice for the audience before we let you go? Um, get out, do something. Uh, don't get out, out. Just like walk around your block. But if you find yourself getting a little bit of cabin fever, uh, you know, uh, get into the garden, um, you know, Go for a walk. Don't necessarily have to be uh, out in the public. Even just go for a drive and get back home. You don't have to go anywhere. Um, but yeah, obviously having a whole bunch of time at home is going to be stressful for a lot of people. So uh, making sure you keep yourself occupied with not just the TV, but uh, with puzzles, games. Um, you know, obviously fun things with the kids if you got kids, and um, just doing things that we used to do before we were all engulfed in in work and stress and politics and all the fun stuff so um you know you might pick up an old hobby or you know <laughs> find a, a lost love that you've uh, you've let go of that kind of thing so like excel yeah. spreadsheets like excel spreadsheets <laughs> <laughs> yes that old chestnut so um yeah awesome man Apparently, yeah. I, I appreciate yeah. you coming on. It's always fun to catch up. Hopefully you guys will be back out and, you know, obviously working, but hopefully the guys will be entertaining us. I know we're all yearning for a little bit of golf. This, this past Sunday, I was sitting on the couch next to my son. It was like three o'clock and I'm like, man, I wish I could just turn on the TV and have some golf and birds chirping and, you know, but it's just, it, it's a oh, weird man. time. I'm weird. sure you've got it too where you've got your favorite guys and you always get your alerts, you know, from the PGA Tour, your mm -hmm. alerts come on and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is happening. Or he's just, yeah, just made a birdie. Sweet. I'm just going to go and watch that now. Yep. yep. That's, that, that's really quiet now. It's, it's <laughs> so. crazy. I can't imagine, you know, like DraftKings, all the fantasy sites and everything, you know, I mean, things have just completely come to a screeching halt. So, all right, my man, yeah. we will catch up with you very soon, and hopefully you'll be back out on the road uh, for good and bad, but hopefully you'll be back out yeah. there soon. Talk to you I soon. appreciate it. You Thanks, Jeff. It. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right, everybody, I want to thank you for joining us here on the live 18 Strong Podcast. This is episode number 279. So once this goes out onto iTunes, you can find it over there on all the podcast platforms that you can find on your mobile devices. I want to thank Nick for being on the show, and I want to thank our sponsor for this week's episode, which is, as, as always, Link Soul for making such great apparel and keeping us decked out here over at 18 Strong. And just for everything that they're doing for the world of golf, go to 18strong.com slash Link Soul to get your 20% off discount code. 
for anything in your cart. And if you're not a part of our 18 Strong Facebook group, the 18 Strong Movement over on Facebook, go there and you can follow along on all the different antics in there, ask your questions. Uh, we've got a great community over there posting videos, posting you know pictures of their home workouts, their workout setups, and all kinds of things. Many of the guests that have been on the show, like Nick, are in the Facebook group there where you can interact. So be sure to go check us out over there. We'll catch up with you very soon. Train hard, practice smart, and play better golf.